Welcome to Swimming with Allocators. I'm Ernest Sweat, and each episode, Alexa Benz and I give you a VC podcast from the LP perspective. You ready? Let's dive in. Today on Swimming with Allocators, we have Chris Duvos, the managing director and founder of Ahoy Capital. Today's conversation was full of gems where Chris shared why VC is a heartbreak business, also how emerging managers can develop long-term relationships with institutional investors, and lastly, what could happen to the next generation of GPs. With that, let's jump in. Today, we are speaking with Chris Duvos, Managing Director and Founder of Ahoy Capital. Ahoy Capital is a boutique fund manager that focuses on early stage VC through fund and direct company investments. We are so thrilled to have the one and only Super LP here on the show to share his perspective on this asset class. Thank you for joining us today, Chris. Hey, it's my pleasure. And by the way, I have to say that Super LP was not a nickname I gave myself. It has nothing to do at all with my investing ability. Sure, sure, no, sure. No, no, it was. I was at a, on a trip with a good friend of mine, a guy named Du Chai, who then was at the Northwestern Investments Office, and now he's at um, at Horsley Bridge. And we were on a trip that like I mispacked for. And we were in London, and I had and I was wearing like a red T shirt that like I was going to work out in, and I was it was like pressed into service. And I had a little red sticking out over the top of my collar and uh, of my dress shirt. And Deuce said, what is that, your Super LP shirt, you know, <laughs> underneath? I said, and hence a nickname was born. So that was like 2002, 2003. It's, it's been a while. Can you share with us your journey to uh, your LP seat? Sure. I mean, it's been, it's been a long time um, uh, that I've been doing this. I never thought it would be this long, but it's been awesome. And I'll tell you, like, I, I had a pretty, like, boring business background but um but uh after after i spent my business school summer at morgan stanley i was like man i want to do something more interesting than this investment banking was like crushing my soul and i realized i wanted to be a principal not an agent and um and i talked to a friend a guy named seth alexander who's now uh cio over at mit and I, you know, Seth was then in the Yale Investments Office. And I was like, tell me about what you do. And he like just told me all about it. It was amazing. Um, I was like, wow, this seems really interesting. He says, yeah, it's the closest you'll ever come to, you know, managing your own multi-billion dollar fortune. You know, I'm a child of immigrants. So multi, multi-billion, you know, multi-thousand dollar fortune was all I had ever thought about. But, um, but you know, endowment management is amazing because you have low liquidity needs, long time horizon, few tax headaches, a single client, all this stuff that makes endowment such great investors. And so fast forward to 2001, the summer of 2001, our guy who did venture at Princeton quit um, to go to another university. And they were like, who wants to do venture? And it was 2001. It was like grim in venture. And it was like, you know, the nose game where everybody like touches their nose and, and the last person to touch their nose has to do whatever, like clean up Thanksgiving. <laughs> like we, we basically did something only a hair more sophisticated, um, uh, you know, about venture. And I was like, oh, I'm doing venture now. This is amazing because it really jived with kind of like my vision of, of what, um, you know, how I wanted to contribute to society and be part of this idea of like, you know, the, this America that was ever, ever moving forward and, and the child of the real and the ideal, the genius of the modern. And so I was like, this is fantastic. And I came out to California and I was like excited to get out here. And then like I came back like drunk with ideas. I was like, this is freaking amazing. Um, and so I was hooked. Like that was that was my my journey to venture to Princeton. Um, and then uh, I left Princeton because I actually started perceiving like in 2004 that there was a um, a change afoot in um, in entrepreneurial finance. So I joined TIFF, opened the West Coast office um, in 2008. And then have been out here ever since and, and left TIFF to go to VIA when they closed the West Coast office because I needed to stay out here. Um, and then when my partner passed away at VIA, I spun all the funds that I'd been managing out into Ahoy Capital. So it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. You, you were a pioneer investor in the micro VC movement. You're, that's, that's part of your reputation. And, and I'm curious where that conviction came from. Um, and, and, you know, maybe it's changed today. Uh, uh, that's that's an interesting. That's a whole other question um, because the world is kind of ever changing, and I will tell you there are 
good reasons for doing things and there's sometimes not so good reasons for doing things. And I don't often, I like really accentuate the good things where I like, I sit around and I say like, hey, um, you know, there's this capital gap. That was a thing that people were talking about a lot back in those days. Like uh, the the capital requirements of companies were coming way down and the big Sand Hill Road firms were kind of forced to write checks that were too big. And so, so a lot of the really early funds like Floodgate and First Round and Felicis, all the Fs, um, <laughs> they uh, <laughs> they uh, really thought a lot and talked a lot about this capital gap and the and the, and this new breed of entrepreneur um, that was that was coming out and, and a way to address those entrepreneurs. So I had this vision for that that was like very pure and. Um, and thoughtful and intellectually honest. Um, if I'm being intellectually honest with myself, the not so good reason for doing it was like everybody I knew was like trying to bang down the doors of you know Sequoia and, and Kleiner Perkins and and Benchmark. It's, you know, you know we were Sequoia investors at Princeton, but when I went to TIFF, like why is Doug Leone gonna like let me in? Like you know because we we do good stuff. Like there's a lot of people that do good stuff, and so I was like, where can I like make a mark, and where can I find something new? And actually, you know, this th th now that I'm talking through it, maybe I can feel better about myself a little bit because one of the things that David Swenson told me is I said to him like in the early days of private equity, and, and you know people sometimes listening don't know who Swenson is. He was like a real pioneer, like, you know, developed like the model that asset allocators like really follow today, in a sense, the quote unquote endowment model or the quote unquote Yale model. And I said to Swenson, a big part of the, the Yale model is illiquidity and leaning into inefficient assets. And Yale started doing private equity back in the, uh, the mid 80s. And I said to him once, and this like really stuck with me while I was like fishing out, um, uh, uh, micro VC firms, I said, dude, was it hard to find good firms? It must have been like really hard to find great firms, right? Like this is this new asset class. And and he said to me, he goes, no, it was really easy, actually, because there mm. weren't that many of them. Mm. He's like, there were like 30 buyout firms when we started this. And he's like, so you decide you want to do buyout, you decide you want to do operationally intensive, lower middle market buyout. There's like 15 of those firms. And you meet with all 15 and you find out that six are clowns. So you've got nine left. And four of those are like not great partners with a capital P. And we can double click on that later. So now you've got five firms. Invest in all of them. Right? You're basically like investing in like a third of the addressable market or whatever, you know, whatever the number is. He's like, it was actually like kind of easy. And then you build an information set and you get smarter and you kind of grow up with the industry. And I was like, oh man, I can do that in this space. Mm. And that was a lot of fun. But like the reality is like that's just a rationalization for me just trying to be like trying to like carve out a space for myself. <laughs> you were talking about what micro VC was like. Would you do that Ooh. strategy today? Like what is the op how does how does your approach to micro VC change? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a really, really important question. What was really interesting to me was in the way I just described, like, you know, kind of the Swenson-esque, like, picking a third of the, you know, of the managers. You know, if you rewind to 2005, 2006, there were, like, a small handful of these micro VCs. I think at one point uh, we did this, like, retreat at Cavallo Point north of, you know, up in, up in Marin. And everybody, you know, who was there, like, literally it's like, um, it's like the picture on the back of the, you know, two dollar bill or whatever it is like the declaration of independence like everybody's there i don't want to name names because it's all like you know secret or there's like this famous bin 39 dinner which like people of a certain age will will remember and you're like you could have invested in every one of those people and made money mm -hmm. right period and um a lot of smart people around that table amazing men women uh younger older like it was it was impossible not to make money. Everybody in that era made money. Um, and there was a, a lot of reasons for that, not just idiosyncratic to them, but the market, et cetera. But, um, but you know, I, ta I talked to Samir Kaji uh, a lot about this, and Samir would track the number of these firms. And so, so I think back to being at Cavallo Point, and literally 80% of the seed dollars in America were at that table, right? A big conference room table, probably like 30 people. 
Um, and then Samir like counts 4,000 people writing, you know, C checks. And we've seen the rise of AngelList and, and the capital gap of 2005 became chaos capital of 2020, right? And there's just a lot of money sloshing around. And so for us, like early on, we had a refinement because I didn't want to invest in everybody. Um, and I missed some really, really good funds because of this. But early on, I was like, look, I believed that structurally, um, single GPs were overmatched by the market. There was just too much to do. And so I wanted to find people. And for me, like, I kind of feel like I grew up with first round. Um, and I was like, this is my archetypal firm. So I looked for groups like that or like true ventures that, you know, spent a lot of money building community or data collective that had all these, you know, kind of really involved, you know, the collective, right? I want to invest in three to four managers a year and that's new and existing, right? Um, and so it's really tight. And I'm like, how do we find this? So what I've leaned into is like, because there's so, and this is a long answer, but like, because there's so much chaos capital out there, like capital is a total commodity, even today when it's scarce, it's a commodity. Um, and so I started saying like, where can we find something that's differentiated? So we started like back to kind of my roots of thinking about invention, not just innovation, but real invention. We've really leaned into, um, uh, uh, people who spend a lot of time in research environments. Wow. That's so much. Th it just shows how like trying to find this invention, right. Um, becomes more and more difficult. Even you saying this now, you might have, you might have started 15 more like research based, <laughs> um, um, firms, so more sperm coming. Um, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. Like every time I do a a podcast, I get like on the podcast you said X, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I am X, and like it's 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 awesome. I think it's great because you know what? That's like the the beauty of entrepreneurship. You gotta you gotta learn. You gotta let a thousand flowers bloom, yeah. and it's my job. Like, there's a lot of pretty flowers, and it's my job to like figure out wh not only which is the prettiest, but like which fits, um, you know, kind of exactly what I'm looking for in that moment, which is also subject to like my portfolio construction constraints and everything. But like, it brings up an interesting point. And this is like my own personal journey. So this is like therapy. Um, I when I started, I was like, I'm never going to be a top down investor. Like I want to just invest in best athletes, like I'm going to find all the best athletes because I'm a great talent scout, right? Like that's basically like how I, you know, I, I viewed myself as like a guy at the combine with a clipboard and, and, you know, big big wad of chewing gum in my mouth, um, <laughs> writing down 40 times. Um, but as it turns out, I'm actually like, I'm like a reluctant top down investor, like not a bottoms up investor. I'm like, how did this happen? Like, it's yeah. really, it's weird. And I'm like, okay, I get it. And like, I, I was like a lot harsher on people when I was younger. Um, I guess that's wisdom as you like feel soft about and, and, and regretful about the people you were hard to, because now you realize they were right. Mm. Well, so I, I wanted so to much humbleness. I, <laughs> yeah. I am just there. Where where has this been in our industry? I think maybe that's been the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have. If I could turn my camera around, um, I have on my whiteboard a. I won't say who this is, um, but somebody who is a household name in venture said to me, he "Goes venture is a business of heartbreak," and. Nobody like actually like thinks that like that's actually a new screen I've like added to my new investments is I want people who are writing checks pre 2016. Um, and I'm like, man, you know what? Venture is about heartbreak. I've been doing this a long time and everybody's like everybody who's new to venture thinks that it's like all about 10 X funds and unicorn companies and you get this whole like you know, the, this whole like propaganda apparatus, like it's the venture industrial complex. It's just all sexy all the time. And man, I've been doing this a long time and I think I have a pretty good track record. Um, if for no other reason, because first round two was like a 45 X net fund. And I'm like, um, that like trumps all my other sins. Um, but man, if this business just kicks your ass and grinds you in ways that like people, a lot of people are doing that doing today, like have no idea. Yeah. Now, now we're getting into therapy because the, <laughs> the, the good and bad thing about venture for me, the reason I, I felt like it's such a unique career path because it resembles life more than any other industry. 
to me. You can meet yep. people or you just, and then think like, why did I meet that person? Like, what was the point of that? And then you can remember, hey, that was a great opportunity. I would bet on that entrepreneur again. It just didn't work out. And so yeah. that is life. Like those are those, cust, you know, constant lessons. You know, and that's actually a great point because I grew up in New York City. I grew up in Brooklyn, right? And and spent time in the in the public markets. And everything's so freaking transactional. And one of the things that like led me to venture was, you know, a friend of mine said runs a hedge fund guy I went to college with said once, you know, you got to be nice to the people on the way up because you, know, you don't want to step on heads because they'll kick you on your way down. And I said, man, in Silicon Valley, it doesn't ever feel like you're going up or down. You're just coming around. Like, you know, I don't want to channel like McConaughey too much, but time is a flat circle, man. Like, you know, it's people are, are around and, you know, and you learn a lot about people and it's a very like in a, in a weird way it's like an intimate asset class right like and and that's what i love about it um i because it's it's like it's i have like six neurons firing that like are all like quasi funny but like takes down rabbit holes the 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 real the real point of it is like um it's really valuable like I, you know, I, I used to have a no assholes rule, um, but there are assholes that I'd give my last dollar to. So it's not that, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's more that, oh, I want to name names so bad, but I'm going to just shut up. Um, it's, it's more that you want to understand how people act in their behavioral footprint and whether they act with integrity or not. Right. And, and you know it's everybody it's fund managers it's it's portfolio companies right like there there are like life defining moments right and and the average venture fund lasts twice as long as the average american marriage it's you know like just as in marriage it's like ups and downs and work in the public markets you don't like a position you don't like the management they can fuck off you sell the stock right um in venture like you're kind of stuck with that entrepreneur i'm dealing with a direct investment right now where it's just like it breaks my heart for these guys because they've put every last penny in and um, of their like life savings and they've done everything. And like just watching their entrepreneurial journey and their struggle. And I'm sitting here and I'm just like, man, you know, life is hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and 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 just seeing them, their metal, right, is is wild. Um, and by the way, life is hard. Hold on. I have to asterisk that because you know what, we're privileged to get to do what we do, right? Yeah. Like this is the A, the best job in, in in the world because it's really interesting and stuff. But B, like, you know, I, I grew up really poor and was very, very lucky to have like a couple of inflection moments in my life. And um, and I wake up every morning, like I, I, I was having a conversation with my parents the other day and my mom refuses to spend more than $5 for lunch. And I'm like, but you're in California, like you have to adjust California dollars for like US dollars. Like it's it's a different currency. Foreign currency. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? It's like Italian lira. Um, and I said to her, I said, you know, you, you just can't, you, like I've been lucky, I, like you have a, I gave them a credit card, like so they're, they're, they worked really hard. Like my mom got on the subway every day at 5.30 in the morning, right? Um, to go an hour and a half into the city. And I'm like, look, I have money. I can like pay back like this this debt, like this generational debt, like the two extra dollars a day for you to get like the the sandwich you actually want will not kill me dead. Um, and it's like a good, it's always a good reminder to me when people you meet people in venture, like especially these young people who like get get caught up in the Hollywoodification of it. And you know, it's it's a it's a there's a whole world out there, and I think is a danger that we have as an industry is that we're like becoming more and more out of touch, mm. um, you know, with what's, what's going on in the real world and the real economy. And, and that's something that we're going to be grappling with um, as a nation for the rest of my life. And we're seeing articulated in the political environment and, and the economic environment, and all that stuff. So that's, you know, the, all that stuff's above my pay grade, but, um, but that's something I spend a lot of time reminding people, you know, we're really lucky to do what we do. Absolutely. And, 
all this is really kind of influences how you think about the strategy for Ahoy Capital. And, you know, I read that it's, it, it, you pride yourself in backing robust nonconformists who have the courage <laughs> of their convictions. Could you just elaborate on, on, on that language and, you know, what is a nonconformist? Because that could look different based on, the, on where the market is. Yeah, um, I swiped that totally from that phrase, uh, robust nonconformists with the courage of their convictions, from an award. That's like the description of an award that my high school gives to like prominent, not, not prominent alums, but like alums who've done like cool and different stuff. I like to think that I'm doing things that absolutely nobody else is doing. But the reality is that if I did that, then then their funds would be like $5 million funds and they wouldn't matter to anybody. So like, that's like the weird thing as an LP, like you want to be different and interesting, but you need a whole bunch of people just like you mm. to, to make these things, you know, get off the ground. But I'm like really proud of some of the things I've done. Like, you know, what I love doing is being the first investor in fund. So like I was the first institutional investor in first round back in 2005, first institutional investor in data collective, like finding people who are like really weird and quirky, and then bringing some of my friends along with them. Is, and is that part of your calling card too? You know, on this podcast, we're speaking to the full range of high net worth individuals who are helping invest, you know, seed a first fund, all the way through to the endowments and the institutional capitals and, and is there a little bit of a gap there in the middle? Like, how, how does one begin to sort of graduate to fund two, fund three, to, to begin to institutionalize like that? There's this, this progression that a lot of funds follow. Um, it, and it actually reminds me, I once saw a cartoon, and it was like, it was this professor with, at, a, at a whiteboard, and it had, uh, you know, he had equations and in the next panel, like, you know, you see the middle, you know, the middle of the, in the, in the middle of the equations, it just says magic, right? <laughs> and it kind of feels like that um, sometimes getting to funds two and three. And, and there's a lot of funds that, you know, raise friends and family, um, you know, a lot of high net worths, et cetera. And, um, and uh, you know, that gets them to a certain plateau and they're kind of stuck there. And then the question is like, what, what allows you to make that leap? And it's different for every manager. Like it's it's, uh, you know, it's it's hard to suss out the one thing that is the answer. Except sometimes people really like get attached to a company, right? Um, in terms of like branding, um, like those guys were the guys, and I use guys gender neutral. Um, those guys were the guys behind X, right? Company X. And um, and that creates a real momentum of its own. And what I've seen is, in my experience, it's most often like one cataclysmic company, which is weird to me because like what we're looking for as LPs is repeatability. Right, right. Right? And so it's like very, very often it's like these guys are in hot, sexy company. Like we, you know, we, well, why'd they get into hot, sexy company, right? Was it like random? Like the number of, the number of like random things that happen in venture is shocking. Like it's, it's almost impossible to like, I, there are days when I wake up and I think venture data is useless because all data is endpoint dependent and time varying. And venture has such a long horizon that you could like cherry pick anything to prove any point almost, right? Um, but so, you know, what I look for is some sort of sustainable competitive advantage. And like for the, the emerging managers who are listening, what I'd say is like, think about, you know, people say differentiation, but differentiation is bullshit, right? There are people, however, who can through articulation of uh, of their process in how they find things or how they decide to invest in things or um, or uh, you know or how they add value after the fact where you can say okay I actually believe that this thing is repeatable um, I believe that these people will continue that the line will continue that you know we're told all day long past performance is no guarantee of future results but in venture you're actually because you're investing when you invest in funds you're investing in behavioral footprints people are pretty consistent in, in kind of what they do. 
And there's so many people right now that are just throwing darts and trying to get lucky, right? And they've bought into the whole like angel list, like invest in an infinite number of companies because it increases the odds you'll have a, you know, a, a, a power law event, right, et cetera. And I think that that's really dangerous. Understand that most people are window shopping um, and those that aren't window shopping explicitly are, um, are, are probably looking at your fund N plus one and so the number of people, I, I almost sometimes like write notes back to people when I get cold emails. I'm like, hey, email me in six months, right? And the number of people who don't is remarkable. It's like actually like a shockingly easy way to get rid of people. Wow. I think, I think you just really spoke into the challenges for allocators, both new and old, um, on how to diligence and develop these relationships going forward. And... I can't take credit for this this next question, but I was talking to a GP who's in the market right now, and they said another challenge is um, they got some average of like how many touch points does it take to actually yeah. with an institutional like I think seventeen came up, and so how do you got how do you navigate through that? And then the second part that she stated to me was that they're also seeing. Um, this um, carousel of changing of seats from, mm -hmm. from, from from people. So how does that influence the diligence process for allocators when they have people jumping around? So remind me to come back to the second one because okay. um, no. they're both very important questions. So one, one thing that really frustrates me is the number of times I meet with people and after a first meeting, they start talking to me like, can I send you documents, like like mm -hmm. legal docs? Like, or, or, and once I said, like, you think I'm going to invest after a first meeting? And this person <laughs> said to me with a straight face, well, you have to, we move at startup speed, you have to move at startup speed. And I'm like, GTFOH, like that is, <laughs> that is ridiculous. Because like I said, you know, you invest in a startup, it goes sideways. That's like 1 30th of your portfolio, you move on. I'm making three invest three to five investments a year, right? And by the way, these funds, like I said earlier, these funds last twice as long as the average American marriage. So repent, uh, you know, mar marry at haste and repent at leisure, right? Like you got to like really understand these people, and especially because you can't sink your teeth into things like TAM or, uh, you know, or management team or whatever, um, you know, or or, or com you know, um, competitive moat, whatever product, you know, whatever, wherever you are, like investing, you can't sink your teeth into that. You have to understand people and people change, right? People's behavioral footprints are generally um, consistent over time, but their motivations change. And there's so many people who call in rich and, you know, people who become full of themselves, right? After a couple of successes and like, and that changes their investing behavior on the margin. And so there's, there's a lot that you need to understand with people. And like, sometimes I, I meet with people and they say, wow, that felt like therapy, right? I've had people cry in, in, in meetings. And like, I, I've actually stopped asking those questions. I used to ask people like, tell me about, tell me about the hardest thing you've ever gone through. Um, and you're like, and... oh, no, 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 second hardest, like third, like not <laughs> yeah, even. Exactly. <laughs> but, but like, actually it was like one person who cried was a, a woman who was like a, a senior tech exec for a long time. And she talked about like the sexual harassment and um, you know that she faced as a young sales rep at big tech co in the you know late eighties, and it was very like moving for her. And it was very like I, I was like super stressed out. I was like I, I don't know like I, I feel bad. You're crying like I did this, um, but she was like, look, that actually made me who I am, right? Mm -hmm. And it's you know that, that it sucks that that had to happen, but like this is somebody who is like an ass kicker. Right. And so it's a short story long. Um, you, need, you need to understand that the second question, which is actually, you know, uh, what I would tell what I tell people, I get a lot. I hear a lot of complaints and, and especially endowment world is a big um, can be a big, uh, uh, you know, kind of rotating carousel um, or revolving door or whatever. The thing you need to understand if you're going to be in the financial markets, you have to have an intimate understanding of the principal agent problem. Right. Some people act like principals where they act like it's their own money and they have they're incentivized and motivated. Um, and uh, and some people are just agents and they're there for the transaction. Right. 
And like, and you, I've gotten people have asked me like, what is the principle? What is it? What do they mean by that? And I, what I say is like, some people get paid by the number of meetings they take. Like that's their metric, right? And if and that's the person who's going to be window shopping you. So like, it's really hard to um, for new managers to kind of suss out what people's motivations are. But the more you can get at like, are you making investments? When you do make investments, what kinds of things do you like? Um, do we look like anything you've ever done before? Do we look too much like things you've done before, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of these, you know, the, the quicker you can get at that, the more you can qualify that uh, that person. Chris, every, everything you're saying, we're, we're on your, we're all on this with you. <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. You guys are like step for step. I feel like it's like, I'm a receiver and I've got sauce gardener on me. Yes. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, I was like, man, this might have to be a two parter, but, um, <laughs> Hey, this uh, is fun. You guys are great. Like, I, I, I'll talk to you guys all day long. <laughs> now we're going to take a quick break to speak with our sponsor. With us today is Tyler Kirtley, partner at Gunderson Detmer. PitchBook has named Gunderson the number one law firm globally for investors five years in a row. Our guest, Tyler, is a dear friend from college. His practice focuses specifically on structuring, forming, and operating VC funds. Tyler is the darn loveliest lawyer to work with out there. Thank you, Tyler, so much for your advice and expertise. Is there anything, I don't know whether it's sort of a story that keeps getting repeated in the news or VC Twitter, et cetera, that you find yourself with a counter opinion or a more nuanced take? You know, venture is a, a high-flying industry from, uh, from time to time, and there are companies that are high profile that have high profile stumbles or crashes. So we've just all gotten the news alerts over the last week about FTX. And, um, and I think there's a segment of the population, particularly the traditional financial world that looks at that and uses it to label the whole industry. But I think being inside the industry, I see what a productive and important sector of the economy, the venture industry is. Um, so I think about my clients, they're very thoughtful, smart people. They're investing in companies, developing new science, um, creating software that's going to help businesses be more efficient, and secure, um, or creating new consumer products. And, uh, it's, it's a great place for me to work. I know when I help a client raise a fund, that that fund's going to turn around and invest in, in companies with big new ideas that are going to hire a bunch of people and that my client's going to use their expertise to help those ideas come to life. So I think it's a productive, essential engine of the American economy. And, um, and, and so I don't know if that's a contrary view, but it's, it's certainly uh, my perspective on the industry as a whole is that it's despite some, some stumbles and excesses, it's a very, positive, productive place to be. Yeah. Yeah. And it, with it's a lot of that hope and dream is sometimes around hype. And it's like, even without the hope, right. there's, there's a lot there. Uh, even without the hype, there's a lot of hope. Yes. Yes. Curious how law firms like yourself think their services will change over time for GPs. Yeah. So I think we're constantly thinking about how we can make our services more efficient for clients so that we're focusing on the high level issues that they're facing, uh, active negotiations and less time on some of the more automatable tasks that aren't honestly as interesting for us to be doing. Um, so one example of something that we worked on as a firm, I actually worked on it as well, was the formation of the Gunderson online fund formation platform. Um, it enabled investors and venture funds to complete their subscription documents online, uh, which had always been done in paper. And um, I, I think though that the core product that law firms offer is their expertise, their ability to navigate changing market conditions, changing regulatory conditions, um, the ability when you have a 50-50 decision to help a client figure out which way we should go in sort of the heat of a negotiation. And I don't view that core product as changing over time. No, you, you for sure have that eye on 
um, the detail and the specificity, as you said, that all these GPs have a lot of other things that they are focused on. <laughs> yes. To get in touch with Tyler Kirtley or any of the other fabulous lawyers at Gunderson Detmer on the Fund Formation team, you can find their profiles at gunder.com. G U N D E R dot C O M. And now back to our LP interview. I've been loving this term you just used of the Hollywoodification of venture and every. PM from Hotco raised a fund two years ago, and and this is a hype business. Like our job yeah. is to hype this up to the next guy, to the next guy, and and the public markets sort of shut that down. And so yeah. I'm curious, what what is the next decade of venture? Like, do, are do we continue to be these hype squad people? <laughs> Yeah. Is that who you it's have a hype to house. be? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Is that who you have to be? Or is that the tone and the um, – is the role different actually now? And the way I think about it is through the prism of something that I call Buffett's equation. I don't know if he actually said this or if I like made it up in my own head and like tried to cloak it in like the vestments of credibility by calling it Buffett's equation. Um, but, you know – Opportunity equals value minus perception, right? This is like a, a value investors like you know kind of thought. So, so think about you know you get opportunity and perception, and then you got you know p- the v- the pivot is like true value, mm-hmm. right? So in the public markets, the way you'd articulate this is like all else being equal, as the PE of something gets bigger, the forward opportunity gets smaller, right? And as the PE goes down, like, so, you know, maybe this is why I'm a value investor lost in the valley, but that's kind of how I think about it. What's crazy is that in venture, you can create a recursion between value and perception Yeah. for a long time, right? For a long time, there's perceived opportunity because people have a perception, Right. Mm. That 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 is driving value. And in some cases, like, you know, when we're in what I call eyeball markets, where it's like all the like social media stuff where like you need a hype cycle for something to get escape velocity. Um, you know, maybe that's not a bad thing, but ultimately there is an intrinsic value that's disconnected from the perception. Right. And um, and we in venture because we don't get marked daily we get marked quarterly and really like only the 18 month financing cycle 18 to 24 month financing cycle which sometimes shrinks to 12 months but it's still a long long time because we don't get marked daily we lose sight of that but in the public market like ultimately you have to sell these companies have to go somewhere right we have 40 somebody said we have 47,000 companies that have received companies that have received some sort of venture backing And I'll tell you, like, you think about, like, in real estate, they use the term net absorption, right? Like, you think about the net absorption of those companies, right? You have 50 to 100 in a great year go public, um, and you'll have four to 600 get acquired, right? Like, it's going to take a million years for all this supply to get absorbed. And meanwhile, we're making more, right? So there's a lot of, like, heartbreak to come, hearkening back to, to, you know, venture as a business of heartbreak. and uh, and so because in the public markets, they don't appreciate our bullshit the way we appreciate our bullshit. Like yeah. we are high on our own supply. Yes. And I think that like part of that is the game. And part of that is, you know, people say fake it till you make it, um, you know, as if it's a bad thing. And I, I, I do think sometimes it's a bad thing. And Sam Bankman Freed yesterday was, you know, found guilty. So, yes. Like it is demonstrably a bad thing. You don't want to like create fronts. But if you think about like the very essence of venture, it's like you're faking something because you're bringing something to life that didn't exist, right? It's that like electricity, the zero to one moment. It's like, you know, God and Adam on the Sistine Chapel where like the fingers are so close, they're reaching out and you can see the electricity, right? Between them creating life, right? And you're just like, that's... I always think the Sistine Chapel is like the essence of venture, right? Mm. Um, like that, 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 that roof. It's like, wow, we're like making something, man. Um, you know, 
and by the way, I'm not endorsing creationism. Like I'm just saying, like that that painting, like it's just fucking electric. Um, it's, it's a metaphor. Like, it's a metaphor. It's a everyone. metaphor. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like we live in a less metaphorical age, and all I speak in are metaphors. Um, to, people, the world is too literal for me nowadays. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but that's uh, whatever. Um, neither here nor there. Uh, so where I'm going with all that is like finding that balance. The problem is when I say when I say Hollywoodification, like the asterisk on that is like also the dilettantification. Right. Where I think people like I have this like platonic ideal of venture people being, um, you know, kind of dynamic catalysts who help unearth, you know, technologies from, (coughs) excuse me, who help unearth, um, you know, kind of technologies that, you know, that didn't exist that are making the world a, a better place and are committed to the entrepreneurial journey. And there are a lot of people who are just like, firing checks like we're at a shooting gallery and they're trying to like you know tag a unicorn i think one of my final questions is how does this current market impact the next generation of gps whether they're emerging managers now or um you know early gps that establish funds i think about like you know if you started writing checks as a principal or early, you know little p partner at 2017 your market, you know, your portfolio might look like shit. And so yep. the results of that trying to maintain a seat might not be the best. It, it might not be in the true spirit of venture. And so how should those people think about their career and, and venture and how they maintain it, given all these changes in the market? Yeah. And look, I, I got to say, like, the way you ended that question was was also really interesting. It was like their career and venture and how they maintain it. Like, I'm not convinced that venture is the best path for everybody. I think a lot of people came into venture, particularly people coming from operating into venture because they thought they were like going up the capital stack or something. And, you know, it became a thing to do, like, you know, going to law school is a thing to do after, you know, being a humanities major, right? There are a lot of people in venture who should be operators. There are a lot of people who are, there are a lot of people in venture who should be founders. There are a lot of people who are founders who should be employees. Like we've had this like weird, you know, kind of shift, right? And at the end of the day, we need to have people creating things. And so I've had, you know, during the post-08 downturn, I wrote this blog post called Parade of the LIFOs, right? For LIFO is an accounting term, last in, first out. Like if you're the last into your venture firm, right, you, there's there's probably a bullseye on your back because like you said, you you were writing checks in 2017, 2018, you know, that it conceivably could be tough sledding for a while. And uh, and when the firm shrinks inevitably, because, you know, those older partners don't go quietly, right? Um, they 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 grip, they have death grips on, on the, you know, the economics of these funds sometimes. And sometimes even when they're retired on the job or calling in rich. Um, and so I would say that to, to you know, younger people, um, I would think about, you know, what is, what is your passion, right? Like, what is it that you want to do? Like, and are there other vectors for that? I was talking to a, a person exactly as you described who loves, I, I said, you know, what do you love about your job? They're like, well, I love working with entrepreneurs and coaching them. I'm like, well, why don't you become a coach, right? That's actually in some ways much more p- pure, because rather than being like a coach who has an economic interest, you know, in the outcome, you can actually be like a pure coach and maybe even help them more authentically, right? Um, but people think of venture as sexy and and it is um, and when it works well. But, but the reality is like the, the number of venture in the history of venture, the percentage of people have actually gotten meaningful carry checks is, is actually like relatively small, yeah. right? And so again, think about um, you know, think about where you might want to go in an operating role. Or you know, I was talking to somebody the other day who said you know they made good money over the last ten years and they want to go teach. I'm like, man, the world needs teachers, right? As Karis once said, teachers teach and do the world good. Kings yeah. just rule, and most are never understood. That I don't even know how to uh, res- respond after that. That's a, that's a mic drop. Uh, <laughs> Well, we we know you you mentioned your phone's been blown up today. So I'll I think we can wrap it up. Frankly, that we've had so much fun. Thank you, Chris. See you later, allocator. After portfolio tile, investing with a smile. <laughs>